Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, this daily devotional time. Uh, this is our last day uh, in the book of 1 John, this beautiful letter that the Apostle John wrote. So our final day in 1 John, and we're going to be looking this morning at chapter 5, verses uh, 13 to 21, right to the end. So just before spring, we bring uh, to a conclusion this uh, time of devotions, and I want to thank all the pastors and uh, a few of our elders who have contributed to this devotional time. And next week, uh, devotions continue, and uh, they will be from the book of James. And uh, actually, we're going to be looking at two letters over the course of the next two months, starting with James on Monday morning, and uh, we'll finish on May the 21st, and from James we'll move into 1 Peter. So I trust that these will be um, enriching times for you. It's been very, very encouraging for us as pastors and elders um, to know just how many people are watching and uh, tuning into this devotional time. And so thank you for the many ways in which you've expressed uh, encouragement to us from the encouragement that you've received from God's word. So let me pray, and then um, I'm going to read this uh, final passage in 1 John. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to spend these few minutes in your word. We pray that you will give to us this day our daily bread. We pray that you will fill us with a knowledge of your will. And we ask now for the help of the Holy Spirit as we read and as we consider some of the great truths that are in this um, final passage in 1 John. May it be for us uh, food for our souls and help for this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the concluding passage of the book of 1 John. 1 John 5, verse 13. John the Apostle writes these words. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Well, in this final passage in the book of 1 John, um, there are a number of things that um, I observe, and I, I simply want to share with you my observations from the passage and uh, make a number of different comments. Um, John uses um, two phrases here, uh, two words that, that jump right out at me. And the first two words are, you have, or we have. And the second are, you know, or we know. So there are things that we have and things that we know. That's what John is talking about in these concluding verses. Now, verse 13 is the climax of this book. It is actually where John states his purpose in writing this wonderful letter. Verse 13, I write these things to you. That is everything in this book, in this letter. 
I write these things to you. Well, to who specifically? Well, to those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know, there's the word know, you know, we know, that you have, there's that second phrase, eternal life, that you may know that you have eternal life. So the first thing John says that we have as believers, as true believers, is that we have the assurance, the certainty, that we have eternal life. Now, all through the book of 1 John, John talks about those who are in the dark and in the light, those who have the truth and don't have the truth. He talks about the children of the God and the children of the devil. And all through the book of 1 John, he, he basically gives us a test he says there are three tests by which we can test ourselves to know if we have eternal life or not, to know if we, were tr we are truly, uh, if we truly belong to God. And the first test is the test of love. And some of the other pastors and elders have dealt with these passages in 1 first, first John. We, we know we've passed from death to life, John says, because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. The second test is what we would call the test of righteousness. In other words, we, we have this desire in our hearts to do what is right. And so John talks about those who continue to sin and those who do not continue to sin. And he's basically saying there's a change in our hearts that comes when we know the Lord. We now desire to do what is right. And the third thing is, uh, the third area is the area of belief or faith. What do we believe about Jesus? And so he talks about antichrists, those who don't believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They deny the divinity of Jesus. They deny the incarnation, the true incarnation of Jesus. And if, if you deny those things, if you don't believe those things about Jesus, then of course you do not have eternal life. But basically, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, if you pass the love test, you really do love your brothers and sisters. If you pass the righteousness test, you, you really do desire to live for the Lord and to glorify him. And if you pass the belief test, you really truly believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he is the Son of God who became a man. Then he says, you know, that you have eternal life. So this assurance of salvation, believing these things, this assurance is really the, the foundation of spiritual health. It's the foundation of spiritual growth. It, it, it's what stabilizes our lives and lifts us out of this constant wondering of whether or not we truly belong to the Lord. So the first thing we have is this assurance of salvation. Now, in the next verse, John tells us the second thing we have. Verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. So we have confidence now in approaching God. Confidence in approaching God. And uh, I think the uh, ESV says, we have this confidence toward him. Uh, this is talking about access, approaching him, going toward him. We don't have to shrink back from him. We can go towards him. And we have this because, of course, of God's wonderful grace, that Jesus has opened this access to God for us. And so we have the confidence that God will answer our prayers. He will hear us and he will answer our prayers. And this confidence is built on this access that we have to God because of God's grace. Now, what he says here is this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So this qualifies what prayer really is. This helps us to understand that prayer is not trying to get God to give us what we want. Rather, prayer is talking to God so that he will give us what he wants for us. We want to pray for God's will to be done. 
And this reminds us of the words of our Lord Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, where he teaches us how to pray. And you remember one of those phrases is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we should not be praying that God will change his will and do what we want, but rather we should be praying that God's will will be done. Of course, trying to discern at times what God's will is is sometimes a, a challenging task. But there are two ways that we can discern God's will. The first, of course, is the Bible. The Bible is very, very clear as to what God wills and what God does not will. And so we can pray, for example, we can pray that we, are, we would be filled with the Spirit and filled with the fruit of the Spirit because the Bible commands us uh, to have these blessings in our lives. Um, so the Bible directs us. We don't have to pray about certain things, in a sense, because the Bible already tells us. So the more we know the Bible, the more we know what God's will is, and the more we can pray for God's will to be done. But there are sometimes those things the Bible doesn't give us clear answers for. I don't know, for example, um, does God want me to be a, a carpenter? Does God want me to be a lawyer? Does God want me to be a, doc a doctor? Does God want me to be a pastor? There are decisions we face in life where we there are no Bible verses that speak directly to those things. Um, the Bible doesn't tell you exactly who you should marry. But we do have principles in the Bible to guide us. But God has also given us his spirit. And the Holy Spirit helps us to discern. And that's why prayer is so important in even knowing God's will. And we should often pray, Lord, guide me by your spirit. May your spirit lead me into all truth. May your spirit lead me into your perfect will. God, the Holy Spirit, can help us. And we have so many examples of this in the Bible. We don't have time this morning, but I have had so many experience of guidance in my own life in discerning and knowing the will of God because I've asked for the help of the Holy Spirit. And all of us, of course, can do the same. Now, in verses 16 and 17, we have two difficult verses. but And I think John gives us these verses as an example of how we should pray. If you see any brother, verse 16, commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. Now these verses on the surface are quite confusing because we know that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So when John says there is a sin that does not lead to death, we kind of wonder, well, all sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. But here I believe John is speaking about physical death physical death. And he's saying that, that not all the sins that Christians can commit will lead to death, to physical death. But there are some cases where a Christian can sin in such a way that it does lead to death. Now, some of us immediately think of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said, Pastor, I'm worried that maybe I've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and, and therefore I do not know the Lord and I will not, will not be saved and there's no forgiveness for that sin. Listen, if you're worried about committing that sin, you have not committed that sin because to commit the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, to actually say and to believe that the works that Jesus did on this earth came from Satan and not from the Holy Spirit, that shows a complete rejection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and the person who commits that kind of sin is not going to be worried about whether he has committed it or not. He couldn't care less. So this is not talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Rather, I think this is talking about things like we see in Acts chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira committed a grievous sin against the Lord. And the Lord chose to take them in death. He ended their lives because of their sin. We see something similar to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says that some of them had fallen asleep, and they had fallen asleep because of their grievous sin at the Lord's table, coming to the table and, 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 and basically not repenting and confessing sin. 
and partaking of the Lord's table. And, and Paul said that, of, of course, is what led to death. So there are some sins that lead to death, and that's a, that's a warning to all of us. So Paul's not talking about those. But there are other sins. And when we see our brothers and sisters fall into sin, we should be praying for them. That's essentially what Paul's saying. Pray for them. So here's an example of praying in the will of God. It's God's will that we do not sin. And so if you see a brother or sister struggling with sin, falling into sin, then of course we should pray for them. Here's an example of praying in God's will. And I think, I think a wonderful example of this, of course, is the Lord Jesus. You remember in Luke chapter 22, he says to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And so we know that we should be praying that we will all be free of sin. Now in verses 18 through 20, the final verses, the Apostle John then talks now about what we know, what we know. And look at what we know. There are three things that we know. In verse 18, he says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God, that is Jesus, keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. So we, we know then that we have this power and protection from the Lord when it comes to sinning. The Lord will be with us. The Lord will empower us. The one who was born of God, Jesus, will make sure that we are not harmed by the evil one. And the word harm here means to grab hold of. And that will not happen. The devil can certainly stir up all kinds of strife and trouble and difficulty in our lives. But he cannot harm us or grab us eternally. We belong to the Lord Jesus for all eternity. We're in the hands of Jesus, in the hands of the Father. No one can pluck us, not even the devil, can pluck us out of God's hands. In other words, Satan cannot undo the work of grace in your hearts. He cannot undo the salvation that we have received by God's grace. So we know that we have this power and protection from God so that the evil one cannot harm us. The second thing we know is verse 19. We know that we are children of God. This takes us back to those tests takes us back to the way we can discern whether or not we have eternal life. We, we know we have this position that we belong to the Lord and the Spirit bears witness in your heart. You know that you are a child of God because uh, you sense the Spirit of God working in your heart and giving you that assurance. And then the third thing we know is found in verse 20. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We have an understanding about Jesus. We see Jesus. In other words, we see who he is. We understand exactly who Jesus is. He's not like these false teachers that John addresses here, um, like an illusion or a phantom, or he just simply appeared to be a man. No, no, he really was a man. He became a man. And as John says, in verse 20, he is the true God and eternal life. We know this to be, to be true. And when John uses the word true here, he means real. That Jesus Christ is real. We know that Jesus is not an illusion. He's not some made up thing. He's not a mythological fig figure that a group of religious fanatics dreamed up 2,000 years ago. He is the real, bona fide, true Son of God who came in the flesh. He is the true God. He is eternal life. These are the things we know. So look at how this letter ends. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. What a great application point. Here's the, the bottom line. If you know all these things that we have, and if you know these truths that we possess, if we know that Jesus is the true God in eternal life, if we know that he is real, then why do we need anything else? Why do you need any other kind of substitute? We don't need idols. We don't need any God substitute at all because we have Jesus. Father, thank you so very, very much for this time of devotions in 1 John, for all of the devotions that we have enjoyed 
and for this one, Lord, that speaks so powerfully about what we have and what we know, the assurance and the certainty that you have given to us. Help us to live in these truths today. Help us to be prayerful constantly that we ourselves will not fall into sin, but to pray for each other who struggle with sin so that we will be victorious in you. We thank you for the confidence that we have in you. We commit our day to you and we help you. We ask that you will help us to live out our faith in these truths for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. God bless you. We're looking forward to seeing you on Sunday, either at 9 or 11 o'clock. And may um, our worship continue to glorify him and you enjoy the Lord's blessing today. God bless.